How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. How are you, David? I'm good. Nice to meet you. Where are you calling from? Um, you think I have a little bit of an accent? Yeah, just a tad. <laughs> I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. Are you really? I knew this. Notice I have an accent. My mom was originally from uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. So I know I know that you were from the Deep South. Right? Yes, absolutely. How's your day going? Yeah. So how are you? I am good. Thanks. Good. Thanks so much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so you're not wearing the top hat, and that was going to be my first question. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, no, that, that top hat's for stage. Use the, <laughs> the hats that I wear when I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So all of these years and no solo album. So. All of these years and no solo album until now, <laughs> until now you know. Yeah. Well, uh, well, so why? Um, I think that uh, uh, there was a couple of reasons. One, uh, uh, I had been, I had felt satisfied with doing total records all these years. Uh, I really felt, felt uh, the uh, satisfaction of getting out my solo efforts uh, to the best of my ability with the, my band as a vehicle. And uh, then uh, uh, my mates in the band, uh, Steve Lukather and Joseph Williams, started both working on their solo records right before COVID hit. And uh, and so uh, they were working on them in the mean, meantime, and they were urging me, uh, uh, trying to get me to do a solo record, too. And I said, well, I, I'm, I've just been fine with the total records. And they said, no, you need to get this other side of you out, you know, the stuff that I was playing them. It's on my um, EP here. And uh, so uh, I worked with Joseph. And he helped frame uh, some of these records, some of these. It was kind of during the COVID, co kind of a COVID record here. Uh, people were going to their studios and making music. And uh, I was no different, you know. It had, it had a nice chunk of time in there uh, to make a record. But it was really reflecting all these old, I dusted off all these uh, odds and ends and pieces of uh, songs that I had had before that were in my kind of my digital closet. And... Uh, I uh, just found that it was uh, uh, time to uh, try and put something out. Okay. It, was there any particular uh, theme or, or for the music or or anything or the song? There was. It was just uh, another side of me, you know, just a show, trying to show another side and uh, a collection of songs. I really didn't have a theme until uh, 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 I had always had this, this um, title in my head for a solo album called Broken Toys. And uh, we got, so the title had been Broken Toys. And my wife said, they're not really, these songs aren't really broken songs. They're just forgotten songs. So I changed the title to Forgotten Songs. Then she uh, conceptualized the album cover uh, with uh, putting all these little uh, collectibles and small toys on it. Uh, so uh, uh, they would represent uh, metaphorically the songs that had been sitting around for a while, or pieces of songs, I might add, uh, that we put together. All right. Um, well, I enjoyed it. Um, oh, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm I thought it was very, very nice. Yeah. Um, I actually, one of my favorites on the record is Lucy. That, that seems to be a lot of people's favorite. That's really? Funny. That's funny. <laughs> it is. People have this... Uh, if the people listen to the whole album, they say, yeah, but I like that Lucy, you know. <laughs> you, must be, you must love jazz, too. Huh? I, I do. Uh, and uh, perhaps a, a Miles Davis influence there. Yeah. You know, Miles Davis played on a Toto record mm. at one time. It was called Don't Stop Me Now on the uh, Fahrenheit album. And uh, we got him to play a solo on it. So uh, I share that uh, uh, you're a kindred spirit when it comes to enjoying Miles Davis. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. And now, it is the first time about a high school sweetheart? Uh, yeah, that was about my daughter and about her coming of age and uh, trying to find true romance here. And uh, that was one of the first records of songs that I did on the record. It was from, a, I mean, you hear the very first four bars is really the demo that I was making at the time. And Joseph Williams came in and helped produce the rest of it and helping me put put uh, players on it and realizing it uh, into a record here. So uh, that, and my daughter uh, does a little step out cameo on it too. 
she sings the high part. And uh, 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 that was a real special treat for me. She's in the music business. Also, she is. She in the she is. area? Or? She's up in Skywood. I can't talk about this. But uh, she's recording today. And uh, uh, she produces uh, uh, video game music with wow. symphony orchestras, using symphony orchestras. So she's involved in the administration and the uh, hiring of uh, these big orchestras to do uh, video games. And so we're kind of kind of connected, you know. Her yeah. office is right next to my studio. So she actually, the, the studio, the story's charming. She snuck in my studio with my engineer and put that vocal on without me knowing it and kind of gave it to me like a surprise gift, which I was kind of flustered at the first time. Like, what are you doing in my, what are you doing overdubbing on my songs? And, uh, and then I heard it and I was just, a, a tear came to my eye, you know? Oh, yeah. That's very cool. Very cool. Proud dad, proud dad, you know? Yeah. So, so what were Michael McDonald and, and Don Felder's contributions? Um, that was on Spirit of the Moonrise. I, I wanted someone, I heard a higher voice in there. And I wanted someone to sing it with me. And uh, I called Mike McDonald. So he sang, sang the choruses with me. He just said yes immediately. And I sent him the track. And he sang the choruses. And then he did some high step outs at the end of that one that you can hear and hear, clearly hear. It's Mike McDonald. And then, uh, uh, which I'm really thankful to for. And uh, then I did the Queen Charade, uh, which is kind of a, my, my Stonesy kind of rock and roll song. And I asked Don Felder, who's a friend of mine, I work on his records. And he said yes immediately to playing slide guitar because I wanted that kind of uh, rock and roll, authentic, really good. And he's a fantastic guitar player, but he really plays great slide too. And uh, uh, so I invited him to play on the record. And he did without hesitation. Yeah, that's nice. Um, you probably don't know, but would you think you'd chosen another path if your, your dad uh, wasn't a musician? I, I think so. I think I would have probably enjoyed wanting to be in music, but I think that the journey there, I wouldn't have had the insight on how what it takes, to, how high the bar is set to be a professional musician if I hadn't had my dad uh, taking me with him to sessions to see how professionals, that level that they play on. So uh, I think that was the uh, uh, that was the be plant of the seed for sure. Yeah. And that didn't scare you, I take it, when he took you to. It, it, it frightened me to death. It frightened me to death. You know, I thought, how am I ever going to get up in that league? My dad says, you just got to keep practicing and just hang in there and keep working at it. You know, uh-huh. like they say, the first million hours is the secret, you know. <laughs> I was uh, just totally blown away when I found out your dad handled the production for the way we were. Uh, oh, yeah. Songs oh, yeah. Yeah, and he, pre- he produced that and arranged it. And I got to play on it. That's me playing on it. Not piano. I'm playing electric piano on it. Uh-huh. But uh, uh, that was a, quite a record, magnificent record. I think that was done in like one one or two takes, you know? And so that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's probably because, is that because of Barbara Streisand and she's so very professional. Oh, and- yes. And my dad is so very professional. You know, my dad can go in and get things in one or two takes. And same with Streisand. That's what that was the magic of growing up in the industry is seeing that a lot. I saw my dad work with people like Ella Fitzgerald and Ray Charles and different people and to come in and see them get performances quickly. Cause I'm used to on my, when I do vocals, I'm struggling all the time trying to get them to sound good and everything. So to hear a Titan like Barbara Streisand sing was just like, she like had a voice like an angel, you know? Yeah. Well, you, you were a musician, of course, before you got, Toto together, uh-huh. um, and um, so was this. How did that come about with Toto? Were, uh, were you friends first in high school, or, or we were? We were in a high school band together when I was four, uh, fifteen years old. I joined Jeff Carl's band, and it was a great band. It had horns. It was like Blood, Sweat, and Tears I meets mean, Sly and the Family Stone kind of thing, and uh, uh, so we were. Uh, all trying to be uh, had our in the back of our heads that we wanted to be session players, but we were just playing in high school at the time. So we decided uh, uh, we wanted to form a band when we got out of high school, but we wanted to get experience first. So we decided the best road was to start doing sessions 
and uh, get experience to uh, lead leading to our band, you know, which we formed uh, uh, probably, uh, let's see, uh, in 72, 73, 74, 75, 6, 7, 8. Six years later, after we got out of high school, I think we formed Toto. And uh, uh, that was just from our band friendship and trying to uh, play uh, music like we remember having fun with the music. And so we just wanted that feeling again. And we wanted, and we had grown up, we, we, uh, uh, our pl- level of playing had elevated to where we were trying to do something new and, and form our own, get our own sound together. So we would have a style, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, what exactly did you, did you see for that, for that style? Of music? Um, we saw that we could do about anything we wanted to, which is why we have so many styles on the record. But uh, we would just uh, uh, to explore and try and find out what our limitations were, which we didn't seem to be too many, except that we wanted to be a rock band and play R&B at the same time, you know? Interesting. Um, I know that uh, Jeff was certainly one of the best drummers, I'd say, probably in the world Yeah, um, at the time. Yeah. Uh-huh. One of the best drummers I ever saw in my life. And this is when he was 14 and 15 years old. Jeff played like a professional, like a guy uh, 25, 26 years old. He was, it was a phenomenon. Okay. That's how good Jeff was. And uh, to this day, to the, to the very last, uh, we were making records together. And uh, he's largely responsible for, uh, I think, part of my songwriting the success is he did great intros on Lowdown, on Lido Shuffle on Rosanna and Hold the Line. All those were, were so compelling drum beats, you know. Mm-hmm. I know you guys, um, I've interviewed uh, Luke probably three or four times, I guess. Um, and we've talked about this song um, that, that, that the band faced criticism pretty early on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and what was all of that? I mean, you know, for the music or for not sounding like others or yeah we're not sounding like the others and they wanted us to be a band that sounded like it was playing on stage at a bar kind of thing you know and uh, um i think it was because we were a little bit too diverse for them we were doing i mean into the i hope we opened up with a kind of a classical sounding shuffle rock shuffle and then we still we had the uh, whole i'll supply the love on it but at the same time we had georgie porgy singing with cheryl lynn on it at times, so we were we were torn between doing R and B and and rock and roll, and no bands had really done that kind of diverse stuff. You were either a rock band or you were a funk band before, and we wanted to be both. So uh, I think that gave the the the, the um, critics something to focus on to aim at, and I don't think they were especially happy with my. I was just learning how to lyric write at that time, but going for it and trying to write my role playing type of lyrics uh and uh so uh i think that uh i was we were trying to follow in steely dance footsteps a lot trying to be very eclectic with our music and our lyrics and uh uh i think we're still everybody's still trying to do that (laughs) yeah 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 and you know and i'm sort of uh interesting to find out that that really i don't think toto was credited uh, a lot or got a lot of press for Thriller. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that uh, we played on uh, uh, The Girl Is Mine and also we played on Human Nature. That's Toto playing on Michael Jackson's Human Nature. And I think that uh, uh, it was a great experience and I think that we were credited. I think we're Toto's pretty known now for uh, playing on Thriller. That wasn't back then, but uh, mm-hmm. now it is. And uh, people have... Uh, because of the uh, internet and technology, people know a lot more about musicians than they used to. And uh, I think it's a, 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 a just a good revelation for everybody. And so uh, Michael Jackson just reached out. Uh, no, that was Quincy Jones that reached out. Quincy yeah. Jones, he did, produced off the wall album. And we had been working with Quincy Jones on James Ingram's records and Donna Summer records we mm-hmm. did with her. And uh, so he was getting ready to do Michael. So he likes keeping his crew together. So he had uh, Phil, Greg Phil and Gaines and people like uh, David Foster and myself uh, were keyboard players and Steve Percaro and, and uh, 
uh, Michael Boddicker were doing a lot of the synthesizers. And I think Jeff and JR were the only two drummers on it. So uh, it was a very tight group. That's interesting. There's, I think there will forever be on the internet Eddie Van Halen or Steve Lucas or um, that's right. Guitar, so. They were they were best friends too. Uh, <laughs> Steve was best friends with Ed Van Halen. That's pretty. I think that's pretty much says it all on on how um, the camaraderie goes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think Ed knew that Steve was playing on it, so he put a solo on it. You know, but that's Steve playing bass and all the guitars except for the solo and that's Jeff playing drums and Steve's playing bass on it too, Steve Lukather. So him and Jeff did everything on Thriller except for the solo. I mean, on on uh, Beat It, excuse me. You know, I got to talk about Africa and I got to tell you, that's probably my favorite. <laughs> oh, great. I'm so glad you said that. I would've, it would have been a terrible time if you said you needed that song. <laughs> I thought, uh oh, he's probably going to say, oh, she's you not going to me a curveball. <laughs> I think Africa until the end are my two. Uh, oh, great. I'm glad you liked it. Till the end was my, was me doing my kind of imitation of Earth, Wind, and Fire kind of thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. With a little kind of, but with a little rock edge to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Africa was an 11th hour song, believe it or not. We had the whole record done. And I started writing the song because I just got a new instrument, a new synthesizer from Yamaha. And the first sound that I heard was the sound that you hear on the intro of Africa. And I just played that riff when I got the instrument. When I turned it on, I started playing that riff and I couldn't get it out of my head. And then what, what came next was uh, uh, the verse melody. I just heard this. I started singing this first melody in my head. And then I, I switched the piano to play it. And when I got to the, I, I started playing the chorus. And when I did the chorus, I start singing those words that are in the chorus. And I said, man, I mean, I'm, I, I, I know that I could, uh, I'm good. I'm decent songwriter, but this is beyond, this is higher level. This is coming from above. This is God div divine intervention here. So I started writing these lyrics down real fast and I sang, and uh, those are the lyrics in the song. And we made it from scratch. The song, we made a loop. I uh, wanted Jeff McCarrow to be co-writer on it because I wanted him to arrange the percussion on it. And make it so special that it would be hypnotic, that it would last repeated listening. So he came up with all the drum grooves on it. And uh, uh, we layered it. We made a loop like the Beatles used to do. where they had, We had analog tape wrapped around the studio, around these microphone stands to make the tape loop. And then we overdubbed uh, all, the individual, all the individual instruments on it. And it just uh, came out as it was a magical experience. And so, though, a couple of guys thought, oh, you know, with some maybe Serengeti or something. I know. Oh, Bill, I got, I got, I got toasted for that. I got <laughs> roasted for that. They were like, people in high school can't understand these words. And I said, well, I'm, I went to college, so I'm writing for college level people, you know. And uh, they gave, I got a lot of shit over that, you know. And uh, plus, they said that the, I should save this album. I should save this song for my solo album. That's a nice way of saying it. it's not good enough for the album. It's not really good enough for the album, you know. So uh, uh, it's 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 so unique and it's done what it's done today. Considering it was barely going to make the record, you know. Hmm. And surely you said I told you so when Weezer came along. <laughs> oh yeah, I told you so. I I didn't have to. That just I said it right there, you know. <laughs> Oh, I was interested to find out that um, you played on um, Where in the World. That must yes. be just an interesting yeah. experience. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, uh, when Quincy got that call, he put it together with Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie, and he invited everybody to play on it. And, of course, we were in Quincy's uh, – part of Quincy's team, so he invited us, me and Steve Bacaro, to uh, go and play on it. We put some uh, little African kalimba stuff on it at one point. And uh, it was, again, that was a magical experience. And to have all those people doing for uh, uh, a just cause uh, was really uh, uh, heartwarming. Yeah, yeah. So what are some of your, I mean, you've got like, what, five-decade career as a musician. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're bound to have at least uh, one or two favorite uh, memories of, of Absolutely. your career. Yeah. I think uh, the girl is mine. We did for the Thriller album. 
who has Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson singing a duet on it. And so when we went in the room, there was George Martin and Jeffrey Emmerich and Paul and Linda McCartney and wow. Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson next to him. So it was kind of a, a pinch me moment. I had to like snap out of the fog. I was thought I was just kind of starstruck a little bit. And uh, wow. sometimes you got to just pinch yourself and go, you got to work. We got to go back to work here and make this record here. So that was definitely one of the most memorable occasions, you know? Yeah. Wow. Uh, so uh, Toto's on tour and you just made an appearance. Toto's on tour. I just made an appearance in Amsterdam and Sigadome, which was sold out 17,005. And I don't usually go on the road, but this was a special thing. So I flew out there for that show. Mm. So, so how is your health? Or are you My health is doing very good. Too. You know, I went through a, a real bad patch there. I'd been touring for two months and it was winter time in Scandinavia. And between the bus rides and the, and the freezing cold, I got, I got my health. Uh, I got very fatigued and exhausted from touring. And, uh, it started to, uh, border on borderline depression and anxiety from being on the road. So I had to take some time off and just say, uh, the, the, my physician said, you need to hang up your road boots here and just take out some time off. So I did that in the, in the meantime, Toto was one to see, still keep touring. So we found some extra uh, uh, new younger players to fit the, to fill the, the bill here. And now Toto's got a new band called Dogs of Oz. It's called the Dogs of Oz Tour. And it's an incredible band. It's one of my favorite. It's probably one of the best Toto bands it's ever been. I mean, it sounds so much like the record, but they're young kids. There's a young keyboard player for Prince's band. And there's a drummer from Snarky Puppy, and and there's a lot of good, good young energy in the band right now. And uh, I'm very proud of the guys. They've done a great job. Believe it or not, that was the last concert uh, my husband and I attended uh, before COVID. Oh, really? Or, uh, yeah, you mean, uh, they were. I'm not sure if you were there or not in uh, Birmingham. I don't think uh, so. I don't in think 2019, so. I believe it was 2019. Yeah, around yeah. September or October. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think I was there. Yeah, I don't think you were there. Yeah, I think uh, I was home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that Luke says it's still your your band, and he's just holding oh. the keys to the car. So um, <laughs> how- it's his band. It's really our band. It's our band. He's really the leader. He's really the unsung hero here. Being the leader, he's the face of Toto. He manages Toto. He makes all the decisions, uh, 90% of them. He lets me come in and make a couple of decisions every once in a while just to keep my foot in there. And I'm the musical director, but he's, uh, he's as much Toto as I ever was. And, uh, uh, he's, he, he's very generous with his praise. Yeah. He's a good guy. Um, what's to- uh, Toto's legacy and, and should they be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, I don't think Toto just ever thinks it's going to get the Hall of Fame just because of the, uh, the politics involved. And I, we snubbed, uh, we used to get snubbed in Rolling Stone magazine all the time. So when they asked us, when we won all the Grammys in 83, they asked us to do the cover, be on the cover. And we said, no, we, I think we're the only band that ever turned Rolling Stone down and said no on the cover, you know? And so I think they've held that against us for at least Lugather thinks that. Uh, that they, they were still on their, our blacklist for, for being uh, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I don't think we're, we're holding our breath on that. Have, have your uh, musical influences changed over have my years? musical influences? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I'm getting more used to uh, uh, a lot of the bands that are out here changing music and everything. I think I, I have some favorite artists. Oh, I like Adele. I like Harry Styles. I like singers. I like, I love hearing good singers and with good songs too. I'm still, a, a, I will always be a Sting fan and a Phil Collins fan and a Peter Gabriel fan, but those are older artists here. You know, I think, uh, 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 some of the groups coming today are, are doing some neat things like Weezer and, uh, 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 what's some dragons, imagine dragons. They're doing some good stuff too. And so, uh, uh, I try and keep an open mind. I still love jazz and soundtrack music. I love uh, John Williams, what John Williams does. Of course, his, his son is in my band, uh, Joseph Williams. And uh, we keep uh, we keep the family very close. Yeah. Um, so so what what else? 
what else is going on with you? With, also, on with me, I'm just doing a lot, of, a lot of me is doing interviews right now for my solo record uh, that I that I uh, just put out. Uh, we'll be coming out August 19th. Right. Yes. Um, I've been working with Stan Carras for several years. Yes. And so. oh, that's great. He loves you, by the way. I appreciate that. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. I thought yeah. I've got I've got to speak to David because I I not met you yet. I really yeah. want to meet you, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time for me today. Oh, and uh, I think pleasure, the pleasure is mine, and I really thank you for uh, uh, telling me that you like the record because I would have been heartbroken if you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really enjoy it. I, I'm I, so uh, good. It spread yeah. the word, and uh, and thank you for helping to support. Uh, uh, the record. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take care, Dave. Okay. You take care.